Hey everybody, happy Labor Day for those of you in the U.S. Happy Monday for those of you not in the U.S. I guess it's just a normal work day, but, but uh, most people go back to school. Kids uh, in the north here go back after Labor Day. My kids have been in school down in Atlanta for about three weeks already. So anyways, it's kind of like the end of the summer today. So I thought I'd come on, do a live stream. I've been uh, working with my son Dylan. He started playing guitar a few weeks ago and and I thought, okay, how would I relearn the guitar from scratch? Which is basically how I'm teaching Dylan the things that I wish that my first guitar teacher had taught me. Before we start, um, I have my Beato bundle on sale. A lot of the stuff I talk about is in the bundle. No, everything that I talk about in today's lesson, this is kind of a lesson, um, is in my Beato book. I talk about it the theory of it in my video course and my Beato book. I talk about the ear training part of it because you always want to be developing your ear in my ear training course. And I have a beginner guitar course, right? Which actually starts with the really basic bare bones beginner. I'm going to show you kind of how I would take the bare bones beginner guitar and what I would add to that to start learning how to play the guitar. Because I would be way further ahead as a guitarist if my first teachers knew to teach this stuff, but they really didn't. It's not their fault. There's just people didn't know these things that I'm going to talk about today. I mean, some people did, but you'd had to actually follow them and transcribe what they did to actually know what they were doing and be able to teach it to people. And it just wasn't a thing in 1976. Um, and I have three shows coming up. I have a show on the 28th here in Atlanta. There's still tickets available at the Variety Playhouse, uh, September 28th, October 17th in New York City. If you're anywhere in New York, I'll be playing at the Gramercy Theater. And then in uh, Berlin on October 28th at the Passion Church. That, that was sold out and then they opened up the balcony for it and it still has some tickets left. So would love to see you. Um, so, so what would I learn again from this? Um, how would I start this? Okay, so um, I'm going to start with just playing basic chords, but like what do you do with these things? Because it, it took a long time to get to these as a player to get to learn these things. Let's say we take a basic G chord here. Okay, that sounds really good. Nice and in tune. Okay, now... One of the things, since I played the cello first, I actually had some facility to play scales and to learn riffs, okay? But I didn't know what to learn. I mean, I could figure out. I could learn that, I could learn Boston, I could learn Queen, I could learn stuff like that. But I really didn't know, I didn't know understand the neck, I didn't know what I was playing. And it took a long time to figure out what I was playing. And one of the things that would have been helpful is to learn uh, if I had an exercise like this, like a simple G major scale exercise. I'm gonna talk about would be something like this. And then I go up here. Okay, so those two positions right here really outline a lot of G major on the neck. We don't necessarily need to worry about these positions in between. Those will come later. But if I just had learned Now, don't forget when you rewatch this, you can slow down YouTube to 0.75 and I would suggest that. You can just follow right along. These fingerings are all in my Beato book interactive, the video course. I go through the, I go through things like this, right? But it goes, it's way, way more in uh, in detail. But then I would take this position I, when I move up to the next one and connect it like this. Okay, and then I'd come down this way. Now I put a little arpeggio in there at the end. Um, disconnecting scales and arpeggios is actually a bad thing to do. They should actually be learned together. 
And there's techniques that I wish that I'd learned right off the bat, like where to put hammer-ons and pull-offs in so that you're not just alternate picking all the way through because it will increase your speed right off the bat. Okay, a simple pattern like that, hammer, pick, hammer, ha uh, hammer on, pick, hammer, pick, hammer, hammer, hammer. A simple thing like that, as opposed to, for someone that's just beginning, that's about as fast as they'd be able to alternate pick that. Alternate picking is very inefficient. Yes, you should be able to do that later on, but this, then, now on the way down on this G major scale, uh, the reason I picked these fingerings is because they really lay naturally under your hand, okay, in a four fret spread, okay. So I'm going pick, pull off, pick, pull off, pull off. Anytime I have three notes on the string, I pick the first one, I pull off the next two, or I pick and I hammer the next two. Pick, pull off, pick, pull off, pull off. When I have two notes on the string, I do a pull off. Pick, pull off, pick, pull off, pick, pull off. And you notice it sounds nice and smooth, right? But here's the important thing. The next thing that I would do, and this would have really helped my playing, is actually learn how to slide between positions. So I did this. I slid on the G major scale, starting on B. Um, I'd slide from the G to the A. And I would, you're, I would be going into this next position. And I'd get up to this high G here. And once I got here, pick, pull off, pick, pull off, pick, pull off, pick, pull off. Then I would go back down to this position. So I put the, uh, a slide right there. You could also do a slide like that. If I were the teacher, I'd, I would have the student do this one week. And then the other thing I do. I would show those two different variations there. Now, um, uh, so essentially I've covered this entire area with a little bit of ambiguity right here. Okay, but that ambiguity is going to be fixed when I start working on the arpeggios. Okay, so connecting arpeggios and scales are very important because it shows you what the notes of the chord are. And this wasn't something that I learned till way later on. A G major chord, when I play it on the guitar, there's six strings. So you think, oh, there's six notes in it. Well, there's only three notes in this chord. G, B, D, G, D. G. There's just G, B, and D, and then some doubling. So you got G, B, D right there, and then you have the double of a G, another G, another D. So it's root, third, fifth, root, fifth, fifth, uh, uh, root, okay? So it's like, okay, so where are these arpeggios? The, and this kind of goes along with this thing that people call the caged system. And the cage system is basically learning out of chord shapes. But I don't, I'm not, uh, I have the cage system in my book. I talk a little bit about it, but I prefer to learn these arpeggio shapes a, a few different ways, okay? That would be the G major. I wish somebody taught me that simple fingering, okay? Also, you can then move to this one. This starts to cover this part of the neck right here, okay? This is what I call a piano fingering, and it's very handy in the guitar. Guitar players don't think like piano players. Piano fingerings, if I play a C major arpeggio on the piano, I play C, E, G, C, E, G, C, E, G, and I play one, I'm sorry, one is the thumb in this case, two, four. One, two, four, one, two, four, one, two, four, one, two, four, right? 
Uh, and then at the top, I'll hit my pinky on the high on the high C, and then I'll come down with the same fingering. Those are called repeated finger patterns. So this particular arpeggio, I'm using one, four, one, one, four, one. And here I go into this position because it's you can't repeat the same fingering here because you'd have this awkward jump of a fourth here. So I, I complete the arpeggio here. But then I would come down this arpeggio. Okay, so right there, there's three different fingerings and I've covered most of the neck. There's really just a couple more. Right, and then. So you got this fingering. So once I get here, I would go. And I'd finish off the fingering there. One, three, four, one, 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 uh, three, four. So that would be this fingering that covers this entire area. And I would I, then I would teach my student to come down like this. And that really completes that. So, so you got this first fingering. Or, okay, and the very last thing, so that would just be an exercise that I would write out in tab. And the very last thing would be this piano fingering here. Which is a great fingering too. So it's one, one, four. So it's fifth of the chord to the root, third, fifth root, third, fifth root, third. That makes it so easy to remember these things because they're just repeated shapes in the hand. And your ear will pick these things out really easy, right? So easy to do. If you were just to show somebody this, a beginning student, you know. Okay, it would take a little bit of practice to do, but um, I'm experimenting when I was showing Dylan these things, and it's really been very easy for him to learn this, right? Um, and this is something that, like I said, there were no books that really taught this. They had books, but they didn't have tab. They just had notes. And if you couldn't read notes, you were out of luck. You were just learning off records. And, uh, and if you're learning off records, yeah, you're developing your ear, which you need to do. That's why I made an ear training course, because it's important to be able to develop your ear, to be able to hear things before you play them and be able to pick things off once you hear them. You know, if when I do these top 10 Spotify things, I saw somebody uh, made a video and it's like, Rick does these things because they, it makes money for his channel. It's like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> the videos get demonetized immediately. And I, I uh, and um, I, uh, I make them so that people can actually hear what's on the charts. And I do it every four months because it takes four months to go uh, for a song, typically for all the songs to cycle off the charts and to see what new is happening. And I pretty much do it to see what the styles, I like to see if they're, if the drum styles are changing, if there's guitar in there, if there's any real drumming going on, things like that. Now, these fingerings here are in my Beato Book Interactive. And it's a video course, so my video course explains the concepts behind all these, right? But in, in addition to that, that supports the channel. You get everything for 99 bucks. The sale's going through this weekend. Uh, in addition to doing that, I can keep traveling and, and doing these interviews, which I, which I love doing. But, uh, but today I'm getting back to actual music videos and how to learn. Okay, so uh, the next thing that I would do is to um, learn spread triads, okay? And this wasn't something that anybody talked about. Before Eric Johnson, there was Pat Metheny, and Pat Metheny did spread triads uh, on Bright Side's Life. He has songs that are only spread triads. Uh, and I knew the sound of them because I had uh, Tom Rizzo that was a guitar teacher. I took two lessons from Tom. He, I mowed his lawn. That's how I got into taking lessons at his store. 
and he was a huge Pat Metheny fan. Tom knew this stuff, but he never got around to teaching me it. Okay, so what are spread triads? A spread triad, let's say we stay in the key of G. B1, 1, 1, 5, 3. I love these sounds of these things. You'll hear me play them. So this is a G major spread triad. So basically a spread triad is you take 1, 3, 5, and you take the middle note, that would be the note B, and move it up the octave. So 1, 5, 3. Then I go to the third of the chord, I go 3, uh, 1, 5, and then I go 5, 3, 1, and then I go 1, 3, I'm 1, 5, 3. So those are our spread triads. You can do them like this. Man, I wish somebody showed me that. Ah, uh, it would have made... When I heard Eric Johnson in 1985 or whatever, I mean, I heard Eric Johnson on uh, actually on Christopher Cross's record. When I heard him, I, w I well, actually, when I heard him, I knew what he was doing because I knew what spread triads were there. Uh, but but uh, I knew what spread triads were then because I was already in, in grad school and I had figured that out long before. But I'm saying if I didn't know what it was, I would have said, oh, that's what my teacher taught me. No, I wouldn't have said that. I would have recognized it by ear that people like that, and Alan Holdsworth would have played voicings like this. Right, that would be a D spread triad over B flat. Beautiful augmented major seventh chord. Love that, right? So, the spread triad, G. It's really, really great. And I would teach the major and minor spread triads, okay? So I, so in addition to the major fingerings, I would do it. I would do the spread triads too. So you want to, because that really solidifies knowing the notes of the scale. And, and where the notes of the arpeggio are. So you got the scale. Right? And then you have the arpeggios right out of the scale. My God! I, I'd be 10 times further ahead than I am, than I would be now if I had known that. I mean, it took years to learn this stuff. Right? And I can come on here on a Monday afternoon and just show you guys, and you can watch the replay of this. You can buy my Beato bundle too and learn it from there, but you can slow it down to half speed or 0.25. I don't know how to eat. Just use the wheel on here. Repeat, view it, and look at where I'm playing the stuff, right? You can just slow it right down. You can see the guitar nice and clearly um, and, and do that, right? So, the idea of playing the scales and <laughs> sounds beautiful, right? Do the same thing with minor chords. I would learn my minor uh, arpeggios here. Now, you can learn this. This is G minor. It's out of this minor shape. So I did something a little differently here. Um, I did. I didn't do this. Um, I don't like. I don't like all these bars like that. I don't like to do three consecutive notes with one finger unless I'm doing. To me, that's way, way cleaner. It's more it's a reliable fingering. You should think about these things as what is the reliable fingering, one that you can count on to be more accurate more of the time. This is a thing that teachers, I think, don't teach enough of, especially in guitar, because guitar technique and uh, pedagogy, it's pretty developed, but these are things like figuring out reliable uh, fingerings that you teach on piano, you teach it on the violin, you teach it on the cello and the bass, but uh, on the guitar, this fingering for G minor, I put the fifth here and I skip the B string because it's way more of a reliable fingering. And I can go. 
So here's my G minor here. So. Then I go. You can do that too. And you can do that. So I have this fingering, the piano finger of G minor. Fifth root, third, fifth root, third, fifth root, third. Okay, or right out of this chord shape. This is how the cage system is related to these things. And once again, the stuff is all in my Beato book interactive. You can get my beginner guitar course and my quick lessons course all for 99 bucks. Okay. And uh, for those of you that just joined September 28th in Atlanta, I'll be at the variety playhouse. I'm only going to do probably three more shows ever. If you ever want to see me do a live gig, <laughs> you got there October 17th, next month in New York city at the Gramercy theater or in Berlin at the passion church on October 28th. And then I'm going to, pretty much uh, call it quits from there. I love doing the shows. I love doing them, but but um, the traveling is difficult when you have three kids that are in school all the time. You know, maybe a few years from now, if I'm if I'm YouTubing, you know, uh, when the kids are out of school, I mean, Dylan's in 10th grade now, Lennon's in, what, 8th? Layla's in 5th? It's tough. It's tough. Okay, so I like playing out of these chord shapes, right? One thing I don't like, I like to be able to bar like this. I like to go one, one, four, three, three, two, one, four. But I prefer to go. Or one, 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 two, three, two, one. To me, if leaving out as many bars as you can, makes the fingerings more reliable. When I say this reliability, I, I, I liken it kind of to, somebody said, Rick, do you have perfect pitch? Somebody emailed me today and says, well, how, do you, how do you hear these things? Um, and, and I was like, and I always talk about this. You've heard me talk about this in live streams if you watch this channel a long time. A vocabulary of recognized sounds. Like what do, they, what do these chords sound like? Right? Uh, what does a major seventh chord, what does a minor seventh chord sound like? What does a minor seven flat five chord? If you're figuring out a song, it makes it um, a lot easier if you can recognize the, the chord quality by ear instantly. And then you just relate the, what the bass motion is, right? Which brings me to my next thing. Uh, so this is, um, um, these are the, the essentially 14 chords that I would learn jazz chords, you really reduce it down to about 10 um, or eight jazz chords. So I would, I would, uh, and these are things that I learned in my first lessons. So, th but this is something I would still learn. Uh, let's say we take, uh, we'll, we'll do it in C here. C major seven, I'm sorry, C major seven, C dominant seven or C seven, uh, C minor seven, C minor seven, flat five and C diminished seven. Okay, and in that position, I would learn the arpeggios of each chord. I go right through this in the beginning of my Beato book interactive. And I like to play the chord first, then play the arpeggio, then play the chord. Then I go the dominant seven. Or you can go up to the third too. Then you do minor seven. Then you do minor seven flat five. The beautiful sound, right? Then diminished seven. There's a lot of different, a lot of different fingerings you can use. A lot of different fingerings that you can use for this. It's a repeatable pattern. If somebody had showed me those things, actually my teacher did show me those, 
Um, and then do the same thing off the fifth string. So we call it root, five, root six and root five. Root six means the root is off the sixth string. Root five is the root is off the fifth string, the A string. I'd stay in this position. Let's say we do an F major seven, F seven, um, F minor seven, F minor seven flat five, and F diminished seventh. Okay, F major seven. F dominant seven. F minor seven. I like putting that root in it at the top. Just so you so you're not just you can do that, but I like to so you actually know I like to, to have my arpeggios that move positions to, to so that you just don't um uh so so you're not locked into any one area and you don't think in a box don't think in these boxes like that then you got f minor seven flat five or add the root in it So if I'm playing this chord here, and I'm playing a D flat seven chord, that actually is part of that's a first inversion of that uh, of a D flat dominant chord, and then you do obviously F diminished. Now these things, I have a very unforgiving tone here, super clean. Uh, everybody's like, Rick, don't play with distortion. So that F diminished chord. You play it. You play it everywhere, it moves every four frets. learn those too that's that is very important right to to um to connect these chords scales and arpeggios right off the bat okay the other things that i would work on would be things like uh how to mute strings that you're not playing i've made episodes on this but i can't um I can't stress enough of how important it is to do that, right? It's like um, muting. I talk about muting in my um, my quick lessons course. Um, I talk about muting in my Beato book interactive, but I can't talk enough about muting. Muting the strings that you're not playing. It's not just for playing power chords. <laughs> If I play a power chord here, just a D power chord, so it's D, A, D. When I strum this, the that note's muted. That's, uh, I'm sorry, that and that are muted. So I, I'm only getting the notes that I'm, that I'm, uh, that I want to get. But if I play one note in the middle of this, let's say I take, turn off my delay here so I don't annoy you guys here. I can strum. I'm only playing this one note G. It's a great practice. So there's a lot of muting going on. My index finger's muting the A string. My thumb's muting the E string. And my index finger's muting all these strings. And sometimes my right hand's muting. But it starts with just how to play a clean power chord. And that's a thing that I show um, how to play a clean power chord on the sixth string and get these other notes muted. When I go to the, when I go to this power chord here, my middle finger is muting these other two notes. This is the thing, when I was a producer, this is a, uh, When I was a producer, 
Muting was everything. I told people, it was like, no, you got to mute that. Don't you hear those open strings ringing? And a lot of times, it's there, there are certain fingerings. Like um, if I take took that G major triad, and I have no delay or anything. It, you know, I'm muting with this hand. I don't know if you guys can see this here. Let me see if I stand up a little bit. You notice that this hand. My, the palm of my hand is actually muting the other strings that I'm not playing. I wish that I learned this at the beginning. And it's simple to do. It's just like learning how to play power chords with no, no other notes ringing. And, you know, I kind of learned these things when I learned, started learning Hendrix, right? When I, you know... Because I... I would learn to. I would learn how to, how to I try to. I would always practice trying to isolate one. Try to isolate just the one string. So you, if you have a lot of distortion on, you don't want. When I'm, if I'm raking across the strings, I don't want any other string. It's hard to do, especially when you got you heard that open string with my thumb, right? There you go. You got to practice. You got to get it to where you've practiced it so many times that there are that there are no other notes ringing, right? I'm playing notes on the inside of the guitar, the G string, the. The D string, you got to make sure there's no harmonics ringing. And that's a great thing for teachers to go over and to get your playing clean, right? These things are, are so, so um, important. Now, sometimes you want to have two notes ringing together, right? But you want to be able to control when you're doing that. Right? So you want you want to be able to... Play the things that you're meaning to play. That's always the idea of, of being a great musician. Play the things that you mean to play, right? Mean it when you play it. Hear it and play it. That's kind of the whole uh, the, the whole idea of all this. So, so if I was uh, relearning the guitar from scratch, I would take these basic ideas that I talked about today and I would make up some exercises and I would practice them over a couple, the course of a couple months. I'd practice them every day until I became fluid in them. And you know, to be able to accurately, you know, let's say I could play six times through without uh, each thing, without making a mistake. To me, that's the, if you can play something six times, six times in a row without a mistake, you pretty much have it under your fingers. There's people like uh, Vladimir Horowitz that I heard would practice 120 times without making a mistake. And then he felt like he had the fingering down. Uh, you don't have to be that, um, you know. Somebody just, Cindy just asked, is it the palm or the base of the thumb? I don't know what you're asking about, but when I'm muting and stuff with the right hand, I'm, I'm muting with this part of my thumb, of my uh, hand, the palm of my hand typically. Um, so you want to be able to do this stuff though with, without thinking. Um, like I said, all this is in my courses here. I sell all four of my courses for 99 bucks. That's how I support the channel. Uh, that's how I'm able to, um, go and make these interviews. And I, you know, really appreciate you guys, uh, uh, get something for yourself, a gift for yourself that will make you become a better musician. That's what we're trying to do here on this channel. So I've been trying to do for the last seven years, improve myself and improve the people watching this as musicians and, uh, and also have fun because that's the other important part of music is having fun. Anyhow, you guys are great. For those of you that it's Labor Day and you're in the United States, we, we kind of consider this the end of the summer. So I hope you had a great summer even though the 21st is really the end of summer. Uh, for those of you that are in the Atlanta area, come on out. 
on the 28th of this month. I think my band Billionaire is going to do a, a short set. We're supposed to rehearse next week. Um, it's going to be a fun show. It'll be different than any of the other shows. Gramercy Theater in New York City, October 17th, and at uh, the Passion Church uh, on October 28th in Berlin. Can't wait. Never been to Berlin. Uh, will I ever get Jerry Cantrell on, Charlie? I will get Jerry Cantrell on, I hope. Uh, you guys are great. Have a wonderful, wonderful end of your holiday. We'll see you later.